Welcome back to Around the SEC, the show where everything just means more. I'm Micah Farmer. I'm Brett Feltz. And it was a great week three of college football around the SEC. A lot of great games. Some scares, <clears throat> Georgia, but we'll <laughs> get ready to talk about this in just a minute. But, Brett, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you doing, dude? Doing great. Ready to talk some football for definitely the first time. Definitely didn't forget to unmute all the mics and record oh, this once already. 100% but, not. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's do it. Not again. Okay. <laughs> so, let's, let's get right into so let's talk week three and let's talk Georgia first off. Barely survived on the road at Kentucky. What did you see? The main thing I saw from the Wildcats is you just got to you gotta step up and not punt that ball. Yeah. You gotta not punt that ball there at the end. You have, you're the home underdog against the number one team in the country. You've, your defense has been playing really good all night, but you just gotta give that ball to your offense. Your run game's been good. You gotta pick up that yard and try to kick the field goal to win that game. Yeah, definitely. This Kentucky team, this is probably, I wouldn't hesitate to say this is the best performance they're going to have all year, even though they only scored 12 points. Mm -hmm. Shout out the kicker. Great, great game from the kicker. Don't know his name. Feel bad for not knowing his name. But shout out the Kentucky kicker, whoever you are. Brock Vandegrift was eh. Kentucky rushing game was actually pretty solid, and that's really my problem with this decision to punt is your rushing game is really what's got you to where you are at this game, and you don't think you can get one yard? I know it's the Georgia defense, but believe in your guys. Playing not to lose is the easiest way to lose. I'll say it all day, every day, and Mark Stoops did that, and guess what? You lost. Yep. Georgia gets a 13-12 win, barely escapes, and will move on into the rest of their season. But next up, LSU South Carolina college game day was in Columbia Willie B was rocking and in the first half it looked like South Carolina might absolutely obliterate LSU but great comeback from the Tigers what did you see from this team like I said I'm gonna give a little bit of credit to Brian Kelly for keeping this team disciplined and not hanging their heads and giving up whenever they thought this game might be over when you go down early in the first half got to give a little bit of credit to the Tigers for coming back, staying disciplined, and obviously that Lenora Sellers injury really hindered the Gamecocks. And that on top of the, um, the what's it called, the roughing the passer there on the pick six at the end, it's just a tough break for the Gamecocks, but you also got to give some credit to LSU for hanging in there and coming back to actually win this game. Yeah, I'm giving all the credit to the LSU talent and none to Brian Kelly because we <laughs> see this time after time with Brian Kelly not being prepared, and if he keeps doing this, he's not going to be at LSU very much longer. But mm -hmm. great game as well from Aaron Anderson, the LSU receiver. A lot of talk about Kyron Lacey this year, but Anderson was the leading receiver in this game, really was a catalyst of this comeback, played really well. And for all the South Carolina fans blaming the refs, you could have, like, scored. Like, this is true. You could, you is could true, have, you could have scored. You could have played defense in the second or fourth quarters. You could have done that as well. So maybe don't blame the refs, even though it, it was a touch-and-go call. You could have played better. So I hate when fan base, unless it is a last play of the game where it would have been a guaranteed touchdown and the refs miss an obvious call, don't tell me the refs lost you the game. You could have always played better. It's like my number one pet peeve. But anyway, the Lenora Sellers injury obviously was a big detriment to South Carolina. But how about Dylan Stewart off the edge? Absolute freak, former highly touted five-star from within South Carolina. So great recruitment for the Gamecocks to be able to keep him in state. And he is showing out so far this season. Really big deal to keep him in state. And he's just one of those guys that you watch him as a true freshman in these first couple of games, and you just know that that guy's going to be a top 10 pick when his time has come because he is absolutely incredible. I, I don't know if I've ever seen a defensive end move like he does. He's just so quick and so strong. It's incredible. Yeah, the movement skills from Stewart are incredible, and a lot of the guys you see that can move like that are lighter guys. Like You think of maybe a Boye Mafe type guy mm -hmm. out of Minnesota a couple years ago who is super kind of a spindly long edge rusher, but Stewart's built as well he's not just a stick that can bend off the edge this guy is an absolute freak can't wait to see what he does the rest of his college career but once again good win for LSU who somehow managed to keep finessing being ranked in the top 25 but mm -hmm. I expect that to fall off as the year yeah. goes on to be honest next up though it's a different Tiger team in Missouri who held on to beat Boston College 27 to 21 at home pretty solid win top 25 win for the Tigers as well so what did you see from Missouri what I saw from Missouri and what I also saw from Boston College is that both of these teams are good teams. Both of these teams are going to compete in each of their conferences respectively. Luther Burden is incredible, yes. as we saw in that one touchdown play. Brady Cook played a pretty good game, did what he was asked of. 
and I think the Missouri Tigers are going to be a team to watch out for in the SEC this year. I completely agree, and I think the biggest kind of X-factor catalyst for Missouri is App State transfer Nate Noel at running back. Had 121 yards in this game, has been incredible all season long so far, and people talked about how do you replace Cody Schrader all offseason? Why don't you get a guy that's better in every way, in Nate Noel? And he's been incredibly impressive, apparently loves black and gold from App State to Missouri, and he's kept playing like he did at App State. Great, great, great job from Nate Noel. I'm looking forward to see what he can do versus SEC defense later down the line. As for Boston College, I think they can definitely make some noise in the ACC. I think having a basically all NFL coaching staff is really making a big difference. Obviously, they have the previous experience with the helmet-to-helmet -helmet communications, which are new for the rest of college football this year. Thomas Castellanos is a great quarterback, going to be able to keep defenses on their toes. And then this is a solid defense overall as well. So I would not be disheartened at all if you were a Boston College fan watching this game. Although if you're a Boston College fan watching around the SEC, shout out to you because I would be very surprised. I want to meet you if you're a Boston College fan and you watch this show. Yeah. That would be very interesting. If you're a Boston College fan, fan watching this please leave a comment so please. we know you exist that would be very cool but next up let's talk about Oklahoma Tulane and this game despite being 34-19 was a lot closer than the score looks it really was um, Jackson Arnold he had a, a decent day he had two touchdowns on the ground but he only threw for um, about 150 yards but so it wasn't a great performance from him but he did enough to keep them floating over a Tulane team that should make some noise in the American this year. You could say they rode the wave. They yeah. rode the wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Jokes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Tulane solid offensive day for them especially in the second half they I really thought they were engineering a comeback for a lot of the second half and Oklahoma kind of broke away there at the end Danny Stutzman played very well one of my favorite players on this Oklahoma defense but the fact that Jackson Arnold leads this team in rushing even this far into the season I know he had 97 yards on the ground in this game which will make his overall numbers look a lot better but still they need more of an RB1 to really emerge you thought Javante Barnes would be that guy he's been okay so far you really need a running back to step up especially once you get into SEC play but how about the game we're going to get the last week of the year in the American between Tulane and Memphis that, is gonna be that a might game. be a playoff game basically really for who gets the group of five spot if Boise State falters but we'll have to see I was very impressed with Tulane though although I did pick them to win. They didn't get it done, so dang it. But next up, let's talk about Texas A&M and Florida. And goodness, as a Gator fan, I don't want to talk about one of these teams, but we have to, and Florida just looks horrific. I don't – what do you do if you're Florida? Well, I'll tell you what you do is you go get a pink slip and you hand it to Billy Napier, say, you're fired. Then you go to another office, hand one to Scott Strickland, say, you're fired. And then you move on and you start over and get people that actually care about putting money and time and hard work into this football program because the fact that Billy Napier is still calling plays is inexcusable. It's so predictable. If it's under center, it's a run. If it's in the shotgun, it's a pass. If DJ Lagway's in, it's read option of some kind. Figure it out. Figure it out. He can't figure it out. That's why he's going to get fired by week six. But it's inexcusably bad for Ford at this point to have the talent they do on this roster as far as from a pure recruiting talent level perspective and not be able to do anything with it on the field consistently. You think that the tackling angles, the pursuit angles in College Football 25 are unrealistic? Go watch Florida play and still tell me they aren't unrealistic. Some of the worst angles I've ever seen taken to ball carriers. No one wraps up. They try to go for the big hit every time. Guess what? That doesn't work. You've seen, it's not even just a Billy Napier thing. The Florida defense, since probably 2019, has this obsession with hit sticking everyone like it's a video game. No one wraps up. Mm -hmm. It's madness to watch as, as a Florida fan, but then the fact that Texas A&M can just bring in Marcel Reed with Connor Wiegman hurt and just say, okay, Marcel, go out there and make a play. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to throw for 178 and I'm going to run for 83 and I'm going to make it look incredibly easy in the swamp in my first start. You can't do that if you're the Florida defense. It's just so bad and Florida, they're going to be lucky to win four games this year. Honestly, I, that schedule really doesn't help them. That's got to be the toughest schedule in all of college football this year. Yeah, I completely agree. Really, the only wins I see left at all are maybe Kentucky, maybe Mississippi State, maybe Florida State. Other than that, you're cooked. So that's, that's enough me being mad at Florida. Let's move on to some sad news of the week. And I regret to inform you that Vanderbilt has lost a football game to Georgia State. It was on the road. So a hard-fought road contest versus the Georgia State Panthers, but still bad. 
That was at Turner Field, right? Yes. Panthers play at Turner Field. They See, do. That's, that's my point. As an SEC team, you can't go to a team that plays at the old Turner Field and lose. <laughs> You can't, you can't do that. You're SEC talent. you got to be more talented than them. Pavia had a decent game for the Commodores, but you got to be more talented, and you can't. your defense can't allow the game-winning drive at the end like they did. No, you can't. You can't just let Georgia State knock it out of the park like that. Jokes. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. But horrible defense from Vanderbilt on the last drive of the game. They just let Georgia State march down the field, do whatever they wanted to, and – if you're going to do that versus Georgia State, you're going to struggle to stop a lot of the offenses you're going to play later in the season. Still like to play with Diego Pavia for Vanderbilt, though. I think they definitely still have upside. Maybe it's just a bump in the road early for them. We'll have to see if they can bounce back. I like what Clark Lee is doing down there so mm -hmm. far. But that is it for our Week 3 recap. Let's go into our winner and loser of the week. Brett, who is your winner? Unfortunately, I'm going to have to give my winner of this past week to Alabama. They, came, they went up to Wisconsin, an 11 o'clock kickoff game, and they just looked like a really good football team. Offense was humming against a solid Badgers defense. Um, Jalen Milrow played incredible. The only thing about him that worries me is him throwing over the middle, but his deep ball is probably the prettiest in all of college football. Yeah, it's a great deep ball, and the Jalen Milrow tape study is weird. If you are a scouting guy in any form or fashion, go do Jalen Milrow tape study. It'll have you confused and having a great time all at the same time. He's a freak athlete. He loves rolling outside the pocket. He'll still look to throw when he's on the run. However, does not throw outside the numbers in the intermediate area, does not throw over the middle of the field whatsoever, but has, like you said, an amazing deep ball. Absolutely incredible. Such a fun tape study. If you're ever bored, just go Google Jalen Milrow film, and you won't get all 22 because, let me tell you, colleges guard that harder than their lives. It's so frustrating. But you'll see some entertaining plays nonetheless. I still thought Alabama was very impressive. Good win over at least a decent Wisconsin team. They've struggled with Western Michigan and South yeah. Dakota, so I don't know how good they really are. But my winner of the week is Missouri. They got a top 25 win at home. It will knock off, like I said, a solid Boston College team. Very impressive, this team all around. I like the defense a lot, especially the rushing defense. So they are my winner of the week. Now from winners to losers, who's that going to be for you? And my loser is it's Vanderbilt. Like I just said, you – Poor Vandy. You just can't go to Turner Field and lose to a Georgia State program. That's no. just not acceptable. The, Clark Lee is in his, what, his third or fourth year? Uh, third. I third year at the Commodores. He's got some talent there that he wants. Pavio, like I mentioned, he's been pretty good for them, but your defense has just got to get better or you're going to get shredded by these SEC offenses. Yeah, so you mentioned inexcusable. How about Mississippi State losing 41-17 to to Toledo at home? You want to talk about inexcusable. What are you doing? What, what are you doing? What? What? <laughs> Just what? I, I don't understand it at all. How are you this bad? Toledo is a very experienced, very senior-led team, but still, 41-17? to 17? If you're a MAC team going on the road to play any non-Vanderbilt SEC school, usually the goal is don't get beat too bad. And Kent State could not achieve that when they played Tennessee. They got onside kicked while down 30 and lost by 70. And Toledo is going in and beating Mississippi State 41-17. to Granted, Toledo a much better team than Kent State. But still, how? What, what is Jeff Levy doing at Mississippi State? Because he's not coaching. I'll tell you what he's not doing. He's not coaching. This team looks terrible on defense. It looked completely lost. I know there's not a lot of talent on this team, but – you got to be able to beat Toledo at home. This, you can't pay a team over a million dollars and then lose. Not that Auburn's done that recently. No. But still, 41-17 to 17 is completely inexcusable, and Mississippi State is easily my loser of the week. Now, let's talk about a little bit of news before we move on to our picks. First up, Quinn Ewers will be out versus Louisiana Monroe, so Texas obviously will lose by 30. No, <laughs> the Arch Manning will be in to start for the Longhorns this week. And after a great first game on the field versus UTSA after after Ewers went down. What do you think you're going to see from Arch this week? I honestly don't expect to see Sark try to make Arch Manning do everything this week. I think he's going to see that they're playing against an inferior opponent, and he's just going to ask Arch to do enough. He's going to ask him to make the quick reads. He's going to ask him to get the ball out quick. He's going to ask him to – he's going to rely on the run game a lot, and I think we're just going to see this – 
the Longhorns just try to get a win and get out in this game. Yeah, this is a great settle-in game for Arch, kind of see what he's made of starting, get a full game under his belt. I do think you see him take some shots with him. Sark's that kind of guy where I could definitely see that happening, especially with Isaiah Bond on the outside because mm -hmm. no one at ULM has Isaiah Bond speed or close. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Arch will do this weekend. Obviously, ULM, take it with a grain of salt. But next up is a kind of a weird bit of news and the fact that Tennessee will be increasing ticket prices by 10% due to a talent fee. So... Because the team is good now, tickets are more expensive? Yeah, I don't like this. I think it's an insult to the Tennessee fan base. Who Tennessee has a great fan base. Yeah. Great fan base. And I think you're just insulting them by doing this. Everybody knows that people are complaining about the prices of college football tickets and really just event tickets in general going up. So for Tennessee to come out and slap an extra 10% onto that price, I think it's insulting, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I completely agree. You're taking advantage of one of the most dedicated fan bases in college football, and I don't like it at all. I really hope this doesn't set a precedent for other teams, but with NIL, who knows what's going to happen. But just wanted to mention that. Felt like it was it was relevant. And Tennessee, stop. Okay. Now, <laughs> just on, stop. yeah, just stop. On to our picks for week four. And speaking of just stop, I don't want to watch <laughs> Florida Mississippi State, a game that is going to be absolutely terrible. If this is what you're watching on Saturday, my apologies. But who do you have? Neither? Question mark? No, I'm just kidding. Brett is picking a meteor <laughs> to come and hit the stadium. Okay. No, I have Mississippi State winning this game. I think Mississippi State is just going to win the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. I don't expect Blake Shepin to have to do or Shapin to have to do a whole lot. I expect him to just manage the game, not turn the ball over, and Mississippi State to try to rely on the run game to try and be just an utterly pitiful Florida team. Okay, so I'm going Florida. Florida's bad. I would say Florida's on the same level as Toledo, and therefore Florida's going to win by 30. <laughs> this, this Florida team, the strength of this Florida offense when it's working is running up the middle with the solid interior of the offensive line. Montreal Johnson, one of the, well, coming into the season, one of the better backs in the SEC. Really been struggling to get it going so far this year, but I still think this Florida team is good enough to beat Mississippi State. I would honestly label Mississippi State the worst team in the conference right now. Then I think there's a Florida-Kentucky-Vandy trio for the next worst right there, but mm -hmm. I I am taking the Gators. Mississippi State is just horrific. Next up, we got Arkansas at Auburn coming down here to the Plains. And Hank Brown looked pretty good in his first start. Granted, it was against New Mexico. You think he'll still be, be able to play that well this week? Who do you think wins this game? I think this is going to be a fun back-and-forth game. I'm expecting a lot of big plays on both sides of the ball for Arkansas and Auburn. I believe both the wide receiver rooms in this game are better than the secondaries that they're going Completely against. Completely agree. So I think we're going to see lots of lead changes lots of big plays given up by the secondaries. However, I do have Auburn squeaking out the win. I think that their run game is just going to be the difference. They're going to be able to run the ball when Arkansas isn't. Yeah, these are two really good run games with Jarquez Hunter for Auburn and Jaquindon Jackson for Arkansas. Jaquindon Jackson has been just a couple yards off 150 in each of his last two games and I would expect Arkansas to try to move the ball that way first. Although, if they can get Taylor Green rolling out of the pocket, Auburn's been super vulnerable there. Cal's Fernando Mendoza, New Mexico's Devin Dampier, both played well out of the pocket, finding guys on the outside, outside the numbers, especially in the intermediate areas of the field. And if you're Auburn, I think you have to abandon the 3-4-4 that you ran versus Please. New Mexico. Please. I did not like that at all. The two nickels is not the way to go, especially versus an Arkansas team that has size on the outside and Andrew Armstrong and Isaiah Satenia. Both those are solid threats. And I really, I need Kay and Lee on the field. Please. At, because I love, I love Keontae Scott. I think he's a great nickel corner, but mm -hmm. it, he scares me a little bit with this Anderson matchup. It's a size matchup with Andrew Armstrong for sure. I just... I think he's very well suited to play the slot. He's an incredible slot corner. I'm, I'm worried about his size on the outside, though. But I think if you get your corners back out there like a normal team and play some corners, some boundary corners, Auburn will be set up to win this game. I think the Auburn offense is more dynamic than the Arkansas offense. And the Auburn front seven is very solid. I expect Keldrick Falk to have a good game in this game. Arkansas's offensive line has been touch and go so far this year. So give me the Tigers. Speaking of Tigers, once again, Vanderbilt travels on the road to take on Missouri and who do you have there? I think this could be a trap game for Missouri but I am going to take them to win. Missouri is coming off a pretty good win against Boston College who like we said we think we're a pretty good team. Boston College I think they're a pretty good team and I also think Missouri's a really good team. 
Vanderbilt, on the other hand, they're coming off a tough loss to Georgia State, and now they're thinking, hey, we got a chance to get back on the map here with a big win. So I think Drinkowitz needs to keep his guys disciplined because we mentioned Luther Burden. We didn't mention his two unsportsmanlike penalties that he had yeah. last week that resulted in a second and 58 for the Tigers. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> it happens. A normal down and distance. Yeah. But I just think if Missouri can keep themselves disciplined and just win the line of scrimmage, they should come away with a pretty easy victory here. Yeah, I'm taking Missouri as well. Just too much talent, really. Mm -hmm. especially at the line of scrimmage. On the defensive side, Johnny Walker, I think, is going to have a field day versus this Vandy O line. And then Nate Noel is going to give the Vandy O line a rough day, I yes. think. So give me Missouri in this game as well. Then finally, college game day going to Norman, Oklahoma. Number six, Tennessee, taking on number 15, Oklahoma. Josh Heupel's first time coaching against Oklahoma since he was fired as the OC back in 2014. Who do you have in this one? I think this is going to be a really fun game. Oklahoma has the home field advantage, but I am going to go with Tennessee on this game. We know Nico Amelivala is really good. How are we going to see the Volunteers run def or run offense against an SEC defense? I think if the Vols can establish a ground game and open up some passing lanes for Nico, he can really take the top off of their secondary because de Oklahoma's defense has been kind of wishy-washy throughout the year. We don't really know what we're going to get from them, so I think – Tennessee's going to come out. They're going to have a strong performance. I think it'll be a fun game, but I have Tennessee winning. Yeah, I agree. Oklahoma defense has been up and down. The real weakness is on the back end and that secondary. And Nico Iamaleava has the arm strength to fit it into those tight windows back there, bomb them over the top. But I think what really sticks out to me is this – this Tennessee rushing game and the Tennessee rushing defense. Dylan Sampson, the running back for Tennessee, has played great all year long. I would expect him to try to continue that. It's really going to be him versus Danny Stutzman in the gap is a matchup I am super excited to see. Then as far as the Tennessee run defense, they have been locked down all season, not really allowing anything on the ground all year so far, even versus their only competent opponent, which is NC State. And the leader in rushing yards for Oklahoma is Jackson Arnold, the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And... If I'm Brent Venables, there's no way I'm sending Jackson Arnold into the teeth at Tennessee defense. And then who steps up at running back? So I think that the Tennessee run defense is going to have a very good day. Then if you really make the Oklahoma offense one-dimensional, how much do you trust Jackson Arnold to be able to function in a one-dimensional offense? Personally, I don't trust him to be able to do that a lot. So I think Tennessee wins by virtue of the defense. Give me the balls. One thing we didn't mention about that Oklahoma defense, though, last week in the game against Tulane, defensive end Mason Thomas had a monster game, especially over the course of four minutes during the fourth quarter where he recorded three sacks, forced fumble, fumble recovery, and a pass breakup including the sack, the forced fumble, and the fumble recovery all coming on the same play to virtually end the game. Watch out for him to have a big game. Yeah, definitely you'll have to watch out for him. Then the other side of the ball, James Pierce off the edge for Tennessee. If he can finally stop getting double teamed, he mm. might be able to do something. But everyone knows about James Pierce. Everyone's been doubling him all year. I want to see him have a good game because he's such a fun prospect for this upcoming NFL draft. But that is it for this week, unless you have anything else you wanted to mention. I think that's all. All right. So that is it for week four of Around the SEC. I'm Micah Farmer. I'm Brett Feltz. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week.